Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India We will continue with uh, the introduction uh, of uh, the global supply chain networks. Mm -hmm. So, what uh, very briefly uh, what we did last time was uh, summarized is summarized in this slide. We said we have a number of players in the supply chain network. There are suppliers uh, from various countries, uh, the manufacturers, either multi-site or single-site or distributors and retailers and there are several service providers. The service providers could be financial service providers, logistics service providers or uh, freight forwarders, whatever. There are several kinds of service providers that are required. And we also said that there is a logistics network that is connects which basically um, uh, transfer of which enables the transfer of goods from one place to the other. For example, from supplier to the manufacturer, manufacturer to uh, the distributors, distributors to the uh, uh, retailers and so on. And also the network is, is enabled in terms of the information transfer by a means of uh, a web uh, network, an information network which connects all the players in the supply chain and this is a secure network uh, which basically transfers information. The information could be financial information or it could be information regarding the ordering, the requirements, the designs and other kinds of things. So, and the next, uh, this one that is connected is the financial network. So, unless, uh, as I said before, unless money moves, nothing moves. So. The, the network consists of a financial network which basically are the banks of various institutions and the transfer of money happens through the banks. As I said, this kind of integrated supply chain network has three net sub networks and those sub networks are basically the demand network. Basically, this is the network which connects the manufacturers to the distributors and retailers and depending on the customer's demand, the retailers order from the distributors and from the distributors will order from the manufacturers. So, this is called the distribution and, and retail process. And the other one is the supply network where the suppliers and manufacturers are connected and the logistics that is involved connecting the suppliers to the manufacturers is called B2B network, business to business logistics network and heavy transfer of material or goods happen through this uh, particular network and this is also called the procurement network. And finally, we have the uh, service network where the customers, uh, the retailers and the service providers and the suppliers are all connected for space parts as well as after sales service and so on. So, these are the three uh, networks that uh, we have sub networks, the service network, the supply network and the demand network. And we also said there are three business processes in the last time, one is the procurement manufacturing and third one is the distribution and retail. So, here uh, what happens is if you want to look at as an example, supposing you are making a Barbie doll and the Barbie dolls are famous and they are sold in the US and such a network, Barbie doll network, let us look at what happens here. The plastic and hair are sourced from Taiwan and Japan and the molds and paints are for decorating the dolls are from the US and the assembly in low cost locations in Indonesia, Malaysia and China and China supplies only cotton cloth for dressing up the labor and, the, and also the labor 
for all this. So, if you look at uh, this kind of globally distributed Barbie doll, I mean, it's difficult to imagine that so many countries are involved in making a, a doll like uh, the Barbie doll and the export value of the doll at Hong Kong is two dollars and out of that 35 cents for Chinese labor, 65 cents for material and the rest for transports, warheads and profits. So, if you look at what happens later is the doll sells at 10 dollars in the US, 1 dollar for metal who sells, uh, who is the uh, OEM or manufacturer of this, this one and the rest covers transport, marketing, wholesale and retailing in US. So, you can see how uh, the cost is um, involved in this and why uh, you know the companies in the US like Mattel for dolls is uh, sourcing from Asia Pacific like Taiwan, Japan, China, Indonesia and so on. So, this is what we call disintegration of production of the Barbie doll. So, even a simple thing like a Barbie doll is made in several countries and uh, uh, you require uh, the cooperation of several countries for making this particular doll. Now, one thing I would like to see is that we found that there are several dominant players in a supply chain. Last class we have uh, found that and they are the suppliers, logistics players for business to business as well as the business to customer and there are several contract manufacturers, original equipment manufacturers, distributors and retailers. But one of the very important uh, uh, players in this are the logistics players. So, I want to just uh, have uh, briefly touch upon what is the, who are the logistics players and how they are involved. So, the logistics depends on the life cycle. In other words, if the product for example, is the movement of semi finished items from one machine to shop to another is called manufacturing logistics. In other words, if you have a big machine shop and you have items at one machine and they are transferred to another machine, then it is called manufacturing logistics. And the other one is movement of finished goods from one end of the production line to the consumer. It is called outbound logistics. In other words, the products, the finished products, they go from the manufacturer to the distributors to the retailers and finally to the customers. This is called outbound logistics. And movement of raw materials from source of supply to the beginning of the production, that is to the, uh, to the suppliers to the manufacturers is called inbound logistics. And movement of spare parts from manufacturers to customers via dealers is called spare part logistics and movement of used goods from consumer to the manufacturers is called reverse logistics. One word about this reverse logistics, it becomes important when the items are of either plastic or steel or something, if you want to reuse after the consumer has disposed of the particular product, whether it is a car or a cell phone or whatever, then the reverse logistics plays a very important role. So, depending on at what stage the of uh, supply chain you are dealing with, the logistics varies from manufacturing to inbound to outbound to spare parts to reverse logistics. And each of these logistics, this one, have their own peculiarities and you have to treat them separately. Now, if you get into the logistics uh, literature or logistics vocabulary, the people call it single party logistics players, two party, second party logistics players and third party logistics players and fourth party logistics players. So, let us just briefly see what is 1PL. Most manufacturers handling all logistics functions including trucking and warehousing. They are called single party logistics players. That is, you do your own logistics. You have a separate division for logistics. You own your trucks and you own your warehouses and all that. So, you do not depend on anybody else for the logistics function. Then, it is called a single party logistics. Then, second party logistics is basically transportation and storage providers 
and that is warehouse owners and trucker truck owners they base and they basically uh, uh, provide the services to other manufacturers in other words if you are a manufacturer you don't own the truck but you outsource the transportation to somebody else or you hire it on contract uh, some other trucker and you hire on contract some other warehouse and container loads and so on so the reason for outsourcing this is these trucks warehouses container lines these are high asset intensive in other words they basically have the, they you have to spend a lot of money on these assets and there is a lot of capital that is needed so people tend to outsource these particular functions and airports and seaports are categorized as two pls now for example if you have an airport airport won by the, mostly the governments and the government basically provides the services to all the players and so on so and uh, the logistics or the uh, manufacturers do not own the airports they use the airports by paying the fees third party logistics players are are very important and they provide end to end value added logistic solutions in other words if a supplier is supplying to a manufacturer then the uh, Uh, the tr truck uh, the th third party logistics player collects this from the supplier the material from the supplier the shipment and he delivers it to uh, uh, to the manufacturer now here if in the middle if it has to be there is a distribution center or if it is a, uh, a truck hiring the driver hiring all this management of the end to end process is taken care of by the logistics provider so it is not just outsourcing uh, uh, the truck like in the 2pl or a warehouse but it is an end to end solution so the supplier or the manufacturer need not have to worry they have to just hand it over to the third party logistics player and he will deliver it to the manufacturer and the, sometimes some of these manufacturers uh have a lot of insurance and other kinds of things if something happens on the way so they are a part of the total supply chain this one so you have single party logistics players two party logistics players and third party logistics players and there is another this one called lead logistics players or llps this llps they don't own any assets in the case of third party logistics players they own the warehouses they own the trucks or they outsource the trucks and so on so but here the lead logistics players they follow what is called leveraged growth model they are just orchestrators and they mobilize the needed assets and capabilities with other companies to deliver value to its customers so here this is owning nothing but managing all the processes here and the the it assumes responsibility for the logistics and management of the collaborative relations or in the network and aligns participants objectives with those of the complete chain so the whole responsibility of correct delivery perfect delivery of the particular assignment from the supplier to the manufacturer or from the manufacturer to the de de to the dealer or to the retailer rest with the lead, lead logistics players lead logistics players of course are becoming very common uh, nowadays orchestrators must be competent at recruiting right providers and developing strong ties with them in other words if you don't own anything and you are just managing or orchestrating then it's important when there is an assignment of delivery of a logistics issue then you should be able to provide the right uh, uh, select the right providers and develop strong ties with them so this is basically a management issue it's like a broker issue and lead logistics players are very important and it connections social networks play a very heavy role in uh, in the design of uh, lead logistics providers their functions and so on so once uh, we have this we basically uh, have the covered so far a uh, supply chain network and we have covered some examples and uh, then we 
looked at the integrated supply chain network, where a global diagram. It has three flows, the goods flow, the information flow, and the financial flows. And we have the corresponding networks. And the good flow is, happens through logistics providers. We have seen that there are single party, two party, third party or fourth party logistics providers and and so on. Now, to look at the other issue which we, we have not covered so far is the globalization issue. We said it is a global supply chain network. So, what does global mean? So, global means your different countries are involved in the delivery of the particular product. So, the supplier is in China, the, uh, the manufacturer is in Singapore, and the customer is somewhere in the US. So, the products or the components have to travel several countries, and it has to visit several ports, airports, and it has to visit several warehouses. It has to be uploaded, downloaded from various warehouses and so on. So, then comes the issue of trade. What are the global trade issues that are there in the very briefly in the supply chains? So, if you have global supply chain networks, it is the convergence of several technologies and co-evolution of several global players. This basically is what is happening in a global supply chain network. And what are the reasons for this proliferation of these global supply chain networks? Decline in transport cuts. Now, most of this 80 or 90 percent of the transport in globally happens by shipping. So, over the last several years, there were several innovations in shipping. For example, containerization. Instead of putting break bulk, bulk products into the ship, you put them in containers and transport them. That gives a lot of flexibility. And also, the ships are larger and oil prices have come down drastically till 2008 and so on. So, there was a decline in the transportation costs. And second thing is there are a lot of standardization in terms of product assemblies and that resulted in outsourcing. Third one is the emergence of internet. In other words, communication has become more secure and cheap. And fourth one is the emergence of contract manufacturers and efficient logistics flowers. As we have seen the six dominant players in the supply chain network are the contract manufacturers and efficient logistics players. Over time, there were several ports that have emerged like Singapore, Hong Kong, Bombay and, and so on and also there are very global logistics players and contract manufacturers that have come in all verticals including auto, electronics and so on and greater integration of the economy by reducing the, uh, the trade barriers. Now, if a product has to travel from one country to another, then the permission is needed from the country. They are basically the global trade and WTO, World Trade Organization and uh, other global organizations have several uh, 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 things to do the to the greater integration of these economies. And this is also providing the uh, improving the economic conditions of these economies. So, that is where there was greater integration of the economies and the trade barriers. Trade barriers are basically the customs and the rules and, uh, and so on. So, you can say a particular product, say rice cannot be exported from this country or you can say auto parts are not allowed into this country. So, you can put barriers of on trade on this depending on the country's requirements and the local manufacturing uh, uh, conditions. So, but all those things are all well sorted out and there is a greater integration of economies by reducing the trade barriers. So, because of all this, there is proliferation of global supply chain networks. And the in this, as we have seen, when things are global, the institutions, which means the governments and social groups, they play a great role. So, because of they pass through several countries through ports and airports, and they have to be managed to minimize the lead time and interview. 
what happens if the uh, uh, the uh, particular assignment or consignment waits at a port. So, if it takes for customs clearance say 8 days or in, in places like Singapore or Hong Kong it takes 8 hours. So, between 8 days and 8 hours the inventory is lying in the port. To that extent so much of inventory need to be maintained by the manufacturer or the supplier which means added cost. So, the ports and the trade rules play an important role in the performance of the supply chain that is both the lead time, lead time means how much time it takes for goods travel from one point to the other and also the inventory. So, the soft infrastructure there are two kinds of infrastructure one is the hard infrastructure and the second one is the soft infrastructure. The soft infrastructure which is it is called trade facilitation. Trade facilitation meaning when, when you are uh, having the trade uh, this one you have to fill in some forms there are some hundred forms that need to be filled in and it has to visit several people the customs officers both at the port and outside of the port and this this have to be filled in sometimes by on, on, a, on paper but if they are made online and they are were done through email then that facilitation trade facilitation becomes easy and it becomes faster and till the, the, the these documents are filled and they are approved the goods cannot move. So, that is where the trade facilitation and the documents that you fill will this one and there are what are called free trade agreements between countries in this between two countries for example, India has free trade agreement with uh, uh, Thailand and, and several other countries with Singapore and it has free trade agreements with, uh, uh, with Ceylon and others. So, these free trade agreements are very specific in other words they are for auto components or they are for food and, and so on. So, those free trade agreements will, uh, will help in terms of the trade facilitation because when you have a free trade agreements then there are no customs duties and it all depends how much of quantities can be basically transferred across the countries by the players and everything is mentioned in the free trade agreement and that that means there, there are no taxes and the, the countries this is a mutual this one one country allows the other country allows something else and so on. And also the customs duties play a role they pay 10 percent, 18 percent and so on and the business friendliness and economic diplomacy of the governments. The business friendliness is an environment of the country in other words not only the government may say anything but what about the social groups, what about the labor, what about the uh, other players who are there in the ports and outside of the ports whom with the, the these particular businesses need to deal with and social factors such as labor unions, industry associations are also important for superior performance. See in other words you are not just dealing with as a, a particular supplier if you are transporting say particular auto components from China to, to India then you are not just dealing with that auto components you are dealing with the entire ecosystem you are dealing with the Chinese government you are dealing with the Indian government you are dealing with the port where you are entering and at the other port where you are leaving and also the customs duties you are dealing with the labor at both ends you are dealing with the industry associations and so on. So, it is basically an ecosystem that you are dealing. So, the global supply chains is becomes complex because of these issues and favorable institute environment reduces the transaction cost and it will positively, positively influence the trade. So, the trade is something is one has to be extremely careful about choosing the country you are dealing with. The favorable institutional environment which is the soft infrastructure which I talked about it reduces the transaction cost. Transaction cost means the cost of final delivery. If you are say going through uh, from ports where it takes 8 days 
for customs clearance then you are maintaining so much of inventory you are paying for that in inventory cost and if you have to pay bribes if you have to pay uh, if, you, if you are passing through uh, uh, some ports with a bad infrastructure and it takes a lot of time and there is damage of, of your goods because of various reasons so then your transaction costs also will increase. So the favorable institutional environment it reduces the transaction costs. So what people say is when you are looking at trade and when you are selecting a country and a supplier you are not just selecting a supplier you are selecting the country and its environment its labor force uh, its other uh, social and other factors labor unions, industry associations and so on. So this is the part that one has to be very careful. If you look at um, over time like 1990 to 2012, here the uh, uh, world seaborne trade in cargo ton miles has increased enormously. So if you look at uh, the trade in 2008, for example, uh, you know there is a that the blue thing is the raise. You will see that from 1990 onwards it is only raising. It is never except in 2008. The reason for 2008 uh, uh, decrease in the trade is the financial crisis in the United States. So because of that there is a sudden dip in the percentage of trade. Uh, in 2008 but of course in 2010 onwards 2011-12 it started increasing. So basically the one can see that the, the sea trade 80% of the trade as I said happens through the seas and that is what happens here in this, uh, uh, this one. So here you can see that the countries are also trying to collaborate with each other. The free trade agreements there were only 16 in 1989 and as of August 2009 there are 171 free trade agreements. So these free trade agreements bet are between countries to countries. In other words, uh, there is the between India and Singapore, India and Thailand, India and, uh, and the United States and so on. So basically the, these free trade agreements have increased enormously. This, so, this free trade agreement shows and uh, the 40 percent of the trade, the statistics show that 40 percent of the trade happens to the free trade agreements. So if you are an export oriented country, then it is important that you have free trade agreements with your buyers. If you are manufacturing say cars, uh, for example like, like Japan which exports a lot of cars, then it must have with all the other uh, players where their its, its customers exist. So it should have try to have free trade agreements so that it becomes easy both in terms of transiting as well as in terms of other factors that that matter in globalization. So in global trade we have found that there are free trade agreements and there are shipping and other costs and that happen and you have basically several factors that you need to worry when you are talking of a global supply chain and if it is a local supply chain that is a supply chain within India or supply chain within the United States then all these factors you need not have to worry. You need not have to worry about customs clearance, you need not have to worry about free trade agreements and so on. It moves within the country and you have a, 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 a truck network, a road network and the network is the one that matters. But of course, India, uh, you have several states, you have uh, several other problems uh, that uh, are associated when you are crossing the states. But still, you do not have customs clearances and these forms and so on. So, the basically what is happening here is the we have seen so far that the supply chains are connected, connected logistically that means through a logistics network and the logistics network whether it is uh, you do your own logistics or you outsource it to a second party or you just give it to a third party or you hire a, 
somebody who organizes the logistics for you, you are all globe, your goods are all connected, the movement of goods between the suppliers to the manufacturers, manufacturers to the distributors and so on, it's, it's all taken care of. There is a road network, there is a train network, or there is an air network or a shipping network, all these networks are all basically exist. Now, the other issues are through trade facilitation and the global trade requirements and WTO regulations and free trade agreements and so on. So, basically this connectedness efficiency improves. But then what happens is the connectedness always brings risk and risk can bring trade collapse. So, so far we have been talking about the good things of uh, the supply chains and let us see what happens uh, when the when you are very well connected both logistically, informationally and financially then you are doing very well because your efficiency will increase, your inventories will come down, your lead times will come down and your financial problems are all solved because your banks are all well connected. But since you are so well connected, anybody, anything happens in any country can transmit to your entire supply chain. This is like a body where a supply chain, if you compare it with a body, whether you have a headache, whether you have a leg pain, whether you have a hand pain, you cannot function. So, similar things happen to the supply chain once it is global. That means anything happen, any, happens anywhere in the world can affect your supply chain. So, that is what we are going to look at now. So, high performance supply chains for the last two decades, for the last two or three decades, people have worked very hard and they have basically, well, you must have heard of what is called lean manufacturing, that is less inventory and JIT just in time, do not keep any inventory, you transfer the goods just in time and total quality management that is you just basically want quality everywhere, quality of the process, quality for the products and so on. You can stop the process if the quality of goods are, are not, not good and then repair the process and start processing again and there is outsourcing as we have seen earlier that outsourcing to low cost countries and so on. There is collaboration between various players, they are connected through internet, they are connected to logistics players, their banks are connected, there is visibility. In other words, whatever is happening anywhere in your suppliers and so on, you can visualize, you can get information, you can through faxes, through video, audio and so on and there are supply hubs where you maintain the inventory before the manufacturing to maintain so that as soon as an order comes, the order can be executed immediately. There is the cross docking where you do not want to keep the inventory in a, man, in a warehouse, but you want to transfer from one truck to the other. So, these are the kinds of processes that you have basically designed so that your processes are highly efficient. In other words, the time you spend from end to end transfer of goods is going to be the least and also the cost is less because you are not maintaining inventory on the way and you do not need any warehouses and so on and also any problems are fixed right away. Now, there are basically uh, the web that is the internet. And also there are a lot of softwares which are given by SAP, Oracle and other organizations for supply chain planning and others. There are lots of experts, consultants who basically are mapped the processes like the procurement process, like the distribution process, like the manufacturing process and they have given the softwares for efficient implementation of these particular processes and they are basically consultants like McKinsey, Accenture and others who are doing this, this kind of uh, software and consultancy and so on. So, high performance, low inventory, just in time, low cost 
and shared services like if you are outsourcing a logistics provider then you are sharing the service all the IT that is done that is required is outsourced to some third party players and where is your data regarding your supply chain it is all somewhere if you are Infosys or uh, TCS or some other company in the United States is handling or IBM is handling your IT services then all your data is stored somewhere in some uh, some memories of some uh, 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 shared uh, uh, shared memories of some of, uh, service providers. So, all this is giving leading to high performance and low cost and global sourcing from low cost countries is another thing that you are doing. So, high connectedness as we said which is logistically, informationally and financially is the result of the, and that results in high performance as I said both in terms of cost, uh, both in terms of um, time, uh, cost and also uh, in terms of efficiency they have become very efficient. So, the final goal of any of these supply chains over the last two decades have been the supply demand. In other words, the supply chain should not lose any customer demand. So, they know the customer is the king is the this one. So, you want to make the entire supply chain that is from the component to the customer uh, uh, product, you want to make this whole thing very efficient and the time as short as possible and the cost as low as possible. So, that was the final goal. Now, but when you have a, such a supply chain which is lean and which is high performance and so on, then it is brittle. In other words, anything happens anywhere can affect your supply chain. So, that is what is what is happening here because you are keeping low inventory. If your truck fails, you do not have inventory, your production stops. Since you are you are following just in time principles. So, in case there is a fire in your supplier's factory, then uh, your supply of your that particular component stops. So, and if you have a shared service, and if some uh, service provider has these memory services outsourced to somebody in some country, and there is a war in that country, and there is an IT outage then your services get affected. So, this high connectedness either for and for there is a financial crisis say in the United States, all the banks in US, US are got connected that leads to credit squeeze and that gets affect your supply chain. So, whatever happens anywhere in anywhere in the world affects your supply chain and that is the price you are paying for the high performance. So, let us look at some of these. So, there are basically tension between weak and strong strengths among supply chain partners. Supposing do you want to have a 10 year contract with your supplier and you want to so that you can share all the information from him, you can share the designs. So, he keeps on doing and if you follow Adam Smith's principle, if somebody is doing something for you, he does it better and better, better and better and so on and also the, you, you are basically uh, having strong ties with them. So, they trust you, you trust them and so on. But what happens here? The buyers may socially obligate themselves to partners with obsolete capabilities and ignore potential new partners. Now, this is a world where technology is changing very fast. So, you have moved from PCs to laptops to handhelds to uh, cell phones and so on. So, basically if you are tied up with one with obsolete technologies then you may be able to there is a risk of you are getting uh, obsolete yourself. So, there are weak ties that is the arms and relationships where incentivize partners to be on the cutting edge in cost and innovation. So, you tell somebody look I am going to source 30 percent of your capacity but the other 30 percent you should get from others. You should be if I if there is a change in the technology then I will shift to some others. So, but on the other hand if you yourself are innovative enough to change to that technology 
I'll source from you. So basically you are trying to keep the people on their edge and then that arm length relationship will provide you flexibility. You can move from one supplier to another. Supposing there is a problem with, with Japan, there is a tsunami and so on, then you can move to somebody else in some other country who is manufacturing this. So for whatever reasons, so if you have, there is a this one between strong ties and weak ties. But on the other hand, if you have weak ties with somebody, if that fellow steals your intellectual property, then there is nothing much you could do about it. But on the other hand, if you have strong ties, then you have trust that is built up over years and so on. So there is always this tension of weak ties and the risks associated with both strong ties and weak ties. So what people were mentioning was that recently in 2008, there was the financial crisis in the United States. Now this financial crisis is basically what is called home loan crisis. People have bought homes and they didn't pay the loans. So the banks went bankrupt. And when banks bankrupt, that basically transmitted to other banks. But why should a supply chain be affected because of this? Two reasons. One is when banks go bankrupt, the other banks, there is what is called credit squeeze. Most of the products like automobiles or the big products, they basically are bought through EMI. So you pay monthly installments and so on. And for providing this EMI, there is a interest that is associated with it. So the credit squeeze means that you have to pay high interest. So people start postponing the buying of these items, which means the demand falls. So once the demand falls, you have a just-in-time connected supply chain. So that means the people start canceling the orders. So when you start canceling the orders, the suppliers will basically lose this one. So basically what is happening, the efficiency of, of the supply chains have become risk creators. Outsourcing, international logistics, internet, credit through letter of credits, and trade and financial flow liberalization, all these are acting as risk creators. So 2008 financial crisis and decline in trade and uh, basically I'll show you in the next slide how the decline has happened in 2008 first, uh, last quarter and 2009 first quarter there was a heavy decline in terms of trade. And this reasons for this is the financial crisis in the United States. Why should financial crisis cause this? One thing is the bank interest rates have increased and second thing is banks also provide what are called a letter of credits or LCs. Now the LC means if the payment from the if you are a supplier to a manufacturer. Now if you supply some goods to the manufacturer, either you should collect cash immediately or should have confidence the manufacturer is going to pay you after some time. Now what is the guarantee that the manufacturer will be able to pay? So the guarantee is the letter of credit from the bank of the manufacturer to the bank of the supplier. Now this, there is a, a price, the letter of credits can be traded, you can take loan on the letter of credit and this letter of credits, you have to pay a price for it, an interest for this. So the interest have increased in the letter of credits and also people started suspecting the foreign banks and so on. So there is a sort of financial insecurity that is associated and that has crossed the, the decline in trade. And similarly, the earthquake in, uh, uh, in Japan in 2011, March 11, uh, uh, that has caused tsunami and a nuclear explosion and, and that has shut down uh, the electricity in parts of Japan and that supply threatened supplies to uh, the car parts and also the, the electronic parts across the globe because Japan supplies the uh, auto parts as well as the electronic parts across the globe. And you can see at the top that uh, the, the financial loss due to the, uh, the Japan tsunami is around $213 billion, $210 billion 
and Thailand floods is 30 billion, New Zealand earthquake 20 billion, United States tornadoes 15 billion, Australia floods 7 billion. So, each of this is affecting the supply chain and there is basically lot of losses that are incurred by the supply chain due to the uh, various crops. So, whatever it is, whether it is a natural disaster or a financial crisis or a fire in a supplier that transmits across the supply chain. So, the supply chains acts as risk transmitters and amplifiers. So, in addition to uh, your efficiency that you create in the supply chain, in addition to the products and the information and the financial flow, there is also the the uh, risk that uh, transmits and sometimes get amplified. It gets amplified because a financial disaster can cause uh, a supplier ineffective because the supplier is a sole supplier. He can or nobody else is, uh, can make those things. So, uh, the supplier cannot uh, supply those parts and the production stops and you have to basically go to another supplier in another part of the country, of the world and train them, have deals with them, all this takes time. So, it becomes amplification of this particular risk. So, that is what happened in 2008 and it is a big awakening to all the supply chain people. So, if you look at the trade collapse, uh, this one trade flows dropped by more than 20 percent in 2008 quarter 2 to 2009 quarter 2. If you look at uh, this one, the, this is the diagram here collapse that. Now, there are two aspects to this. One is the connectedness. In other words, the trade collapse happened across the world for all the countries. You can see the various colors here depends on the exports and imports of various countries. Both exports, imports for India, Japan, United States, everybody, every country it has simultaneously dropped. So, there is this synchronous collapse of this. Why should there be synchronous collapse of this? So, that is because of the connectedness. So, to explain this you can see that um, uh, the, the supply chain since they are connected and everything happens just in time. Once the orders are cancelled due to credit squeeze in the United States, then the uh, manufacturers have cancelled the orders to the suppliers because they have a lot of inventory, they are unsure of what happens to the demand. So, the tail end of the supply chain is in China for the manufacturing and they basically have lost their jobs and so on. And the logistics providers who basically transfer the goods from China to United States, they also have lot of vacant capacity. So, synchronization was due to the connectivity of the global supply chains that reacted just in time to the collapse in demand. So, it is very important one needs to know not only the advantages of connectivity, but the disadvantages as well. So, the global supply chains were a great innovation and basically it has provided employment, it has provided uh, connectivity, it has provided several uh, low cost sourcing to several people, but the only thing is when it falls, it falls uh, the same thing. So, what do you have here is, what is that we are studying in the supply chains here? We have studied in the global supply chain management, we looked at the network, we looked at the configuration of the network. We have these players all over the world in the globe, that is the, uh, the suppliers in one country, the manufacturers in another country and the logistics players transferring from one port to the other. There are banks and there are governments involved, there are government rules and regulations as well as there are social factors like labor unions, organizations and so on. In addition, there are resources that are needed. In other words, if it is a food supply chain, 
uh, require uh, the rice water, the right to be water and, and power and so on, they are natural resources. If you want for transportation, you need oil and, uh, and power and in addition to all this, you need human resources. So, India has the IT companies outsource a lot of things uh, to India because India has English speaking IT trained professionals. So, that becomes a big advantage. The low cost, low cost labor is one of the advantages of globalization. So, but when you are dealing with all this, you are dealing with a global supply chain which is interconnected via logistics players, via internet, via the financial banks and you are crossing countries, ports and so on. It is a complex network of various organizations and for its performance, yes, we have designed a system of performance over the last two, three decades of just in time, high connectedness and so on and various kinds of uh, deals between companies and they have ports which were developed for easy transfer of materials, transshipment ports and all that and there are risks, we have seen their risks. Now, how do we study such a global supply chain? Now, if you look at the supply chain literature so far, then most of them are dealing with the inventory minimization. There are a lot of books, a lot of research papers, case studies and so on, but what they basically deal with are the, the ordinary networks <coughs> and uh, the, uh, the, this one, but the, in other words, they study the inventory minimization, but there is no framework study to global supply chain taking into effect all the factors that that the supply chain is affected by. In other words, the supply chain is dependent on factors that are exogenous to the supply chain. It is not just the supplier, manufacturer and uh, the logistics providers and all. You have the labor unions, you have the governments, you have the resources, you have educational institutions who are training these people, you have logistics infrastructure uh, and so on. So, all these things play a role. So, credit squeeze after the financial crisis, environmental regulations, protectionist policies of the government, political unrest, economic stability, natural disasters or non-supply chain factors that affect the supply chain performance, right? Now, do you have a framework that deals with all this? In other words, can I have one framework which where I can study the performance? where I can map the global supply chain or all the factors, the governments, the resources, the infrastructure and into a particular diagram and then study the performance, the performance, the risk and the innovations that are possible and so on. So, that is the one that is the aim of this course to present the supply chain ecosystem framework to holistically model all the factors that interact with the supply chain and visualize operational, strategic, management and execution issues and risk mitigation strategies. So, here although the material that we have covered so far can be found in, in the books, but the emphasis in our course is going to be on factors how to design supply chains how to analyze supply chains, how to innovate supply chains which are basically dependent on all external factors, the economies, the resources and the infrastructure and other factors and basically and how to design, minimize the resilient supply chains and that is going to be the subject matter of the future lectures uh, in this. So, yeah, I'm done.